This book is precedent setting um, grass fed beef for a post pandemic world. How about that, huh? You're not going to find a better, uh, better titled book than that one. Um, and um, <clears throat> the subtitle is How Regenerative Grazing Can Restore Soils and Stabilize the Climate. Yeah, that's a yabo. Can I get it? Can I get a yabo on on that? Uh, here, here is the the book that uh, the original one wrote: Grass Fed Beef for a Post Pandemic World: How Regenerative Grazing Can Restore Soils and Stabilize the Climate. Just love the title itself. It's just oozing with goodness. I agree with every every phrase there, and um, of course, it has the intro by Gay Brown. It's on Chelsea Green Press, which is Vermont based. Let's hear it for Vermont. Let's hear it for Vermont. Um, and um, so let me just go over, you know, the section. So it's basically there's three main sections here. Um, the section one or part one is called impacts of regenerative grazing. And then the sub um, chapters are regional resilience, the empty breadbasket, cattle as global heroes, the roots of health and animal welfare. And then <clears throat> there's part two, which is keys to success with grass-fed beef. The chapters are achieving wholesome benefits and turning a profit. So that's clearly, you know, the, the business side of this. And then part three is remaining challenges. The chapters are cattle into beef, public awareness and public policies and policy. Well, you know, I just came back from COP27 in Egypt. So I'm eyeball deep in policy on all this stuff. So basically part one, the impacts of regenerative grazing, that's sort of the big picture, that the, the environmental picture and the climate picture and the health picture, environment, climate, health, um, including animal welfare, part two, keys to success. So that's the business side. And then part three is remaining challenges. So but why don't uh, uh, Wynn and Ridge, you guys uh, start with just a, a further elucidation of each of those sections and, and perhaps even, if you will, the, the gestalt of the book in general. So, okay, so I'm going to I'm going to let Lynn speak to that. But before we start, I want to read the epigraph to the introduction, which is a quote from Henry A. Wallace, who was the secretary of agriculture in 1940 a long time ago. This is what he says. Grass will act as the great balance wheel and stabilizer to prevent gluts of other crops, to save the soil from destruction, to build up a reserve of nutrients and moisture in the soil, ready for any future emergency, to create a prosperous livestock industry, and finally, to contribute to the health of our people through better nutrition. This is the Secretary of Agriculture in 1940. A long, long time ago. Yeah, yeah. We knew what this. A, what a visionary. <laughs> well, you know, Seth, um, we felt it was really important in that first section where it lists all the impacts to do some myth busting because there's so much misinformation out there. And we wanted to address some of the concerns that we see over and over again, like, is there enough land, you know, is one. This just, just one, but, but that's one we hear often. And yes, in fact, the math has been done. We do have enough land, given the, the amount that's, uh, you know, going now to raise corn for, to feed cattle and um, uh, uh, other sources of land. But, but uh, oh, another one that drives us crazy is what about methane? You know, so we address how uh, grass-fed cattle, in fact, produce less methane and explain why. Basically, we use these chapters to, um, uh, which tend to be a little science heavy, maybe. Uh, they're, they're carefully documented. Uh, one of them has 87 footnotes, I remember that painfully. Uh, because we want people to understand this is a science-based, even though it's, it's, it's old, predates human agriculture and human beings on earth in terms of, you know, going back to the years when great herds of ruminants were roaming the earth and methane was not a problem, for example. Um, but but um, we, we do feel it's, uh, 
important to that people understand that this is not some you know a vision uh, <laughs> high in the sky type thing this, we're talking about practices that are in place you know in, in this country and all over the world and um so we want to cite the science and we wanted to cite the science and just break those things down and um i think particularly because as i said before the climate activists that they're not the, the, these people and i and i would be the same way would not just accept you know uh, uh, a a superficial treatment of this how so how does it combat climate change how does it sequester carbon so so that's why we just take it right right into the field the cow takes a bite of grass and what happens and we you know we we try to try to provide people with different pathways through the book for people that don't want to go into the weeds so much they can they can uh, they might just want to read the sidebars or read the stories of Ridge's travels around the country and around the world. Um, but other people that want that detail, it's there. And the documentation is in the footnote. So, so that's what we're trying to achieve in that first section. And then in the second section, you've described it as the business, and it is the business of producing grass-fed beef. But that's where we, some people might think that, you know, those, those are the how-to chapters, chapter six and seven have most of the how to uh, you know how to how to how to what what are the basics of of regenerative grazing and this is where ridge's extensive experience uh with this is is so important and but we feel that that those chapters are also important for uh, you know concerned consumers and policymakers because they need to know that um Again, this is, you know, that this the practices are, have been developed. We know how to do this. It is being doing. It is being done, and you know, we present it in a way that they'll realize, Jesus, this this is a lot to this. So we, and also in chapter seven, uh, um, that's where we focus more on this concept of net profitability that you don't need to be wealthy you don't need to be a landowner um because you you know you can rent land or get free land from uh uh you know public lands conservation lands uh you can you don't need a barn you don't even need a tractor and we kind of spell that out some strategies for you know running a lean operation and the exciting thing for us about that is that it points to the fact that um people in populations that haven't had access to land who haven't who who can't find a way in to um being owners or operators or even skilled laborers in our food system there with grass-fed beef it presents those opportunities even creates a new skilled agricultural niche with the with the skilled finishing um so that's you know that's what section two that's why section two we feel that the 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 how to those two how to do it chapters are important for everyone not just farmers because there's there's some big social justice issues and economic justice issues there and that's true also of uh, of chapter eight uh, about it's called uh, cat cattle into beef, but it's it's about processing, and you know this is as one of our reviewers said an unromanticized uh, 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 look at the processing problems that that are out there, and we we don't we don't skim over those, and those too are important not just for people who are producing beef and want to figure out how they're going to get them processed, but citizens who are concerned about you know the the fact that 85 percent of the meat out there is controlled by four giant corporations uh there's there's social uh, and, and also the, the well-being of people who are uh working in agriculture and working in processing plants and for people who are concerned about those things and there's a lot of us um will find a lot of interest i think in 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 chapter eight on processing and in chapter nine uh uh on um as i mentioned 
public policies and and particularly um, you know some of the climate strategies that have been floated. Uh, so so Seth is the, oh I don't want to interrupt Ridge but let us know if is this what you had in mind by a quick overview of those sections? Yeah yes yes absolutely thank you. Yeah, what I was going to say is one of the uh, big needs that we're discovering is that there's a lot of people that want to jump into grass-fed beef, wealthy people with a piece of land. And numerous, uh, a number of these people have contacted me, and what they're missing is the skill set of uh, grazers who know how to do this. And, you know, we're, we're embarked on <clears throat> trying to figure out how to do some training at a scale, because it's not it's not rocket science, but it's not easy. You know, you do have to learn yeah, to, to look at the ruminant. Is the ruminant, is the ruminant full? Can the cattle walk? You know, do they have enough to eat? Uh, and, and all the health things. So um, that's what we're finding is right now where the, the whole field is limited, but it's also very exciting because it means that we need a lot of people to get involved, get trained, and whether they work for somebody else and become a grazer, or whether they lease some land, or they, you know, rent some land or whatever, and get involved. But the, but the opportunity as this market expands is huge to include a whole lot of people, um, and the skill sets are um, what is necessary. And you know, we're very excited because you know we know how to teach people how to do it. So that's one of the things that. Our new not-for-profit, uh, New England Grass-Fed Beef Initiative, is engaged in is trying to figure out how to get that training up and running because it's a it's a tremendous need in the marketplace right now. Yeah, just expand on that just a, a, a little bit, to, to, just to add a detail that I think will be uh, in, exciting to a lot of people is that already you have people who have learned to do this. They've learned to. But when we talk about finishing, we, we should probably explain that um, one of the challenges of grass-fed beef um, uh, is fattening the cattle on, on pasture, on grass and other pasture plants, you know, with no grain. And uh, it, it's a, it's a, it can, can easily be, I shouldn't say easily, it certainly can be done and people have learned to do it. And some of those people are now making a living custom grazing. So you see, this is what I mean by a new niche. And it's, it's very exciting that, you know, people, there's now uh, um, people to, that want to get involved in this have a, there's a whole range of possibilities. Let's say they, they have a day job, they're school teachers or they're, um, they sell power tools or they're, you know, whatever they're doing, but they also are, you know, running a 20 head out, you know, in the back 40. Um, that those people uh, have a chance to participate in this by being cow-calf producers, which does not require the full-time commitment that being a grazier does. Um, so that, that there's that's one one of the big points, and and Carl had told us that he was thrilled to see this in our book. That we point out that the you it's really beneficial to separate the two phases of producing grass-fed beef. There's the there's producing the young stock, and that's the that still involves moving the cattle, but maybe moving the cattle every few days. Then you have um, you can aggregate the the young stock from those uh, cow calf operations onto a, a finishing farm, or you know uh, put them in uh, under the care of of a a finisher, a skilled grazier, uh, who can move handle five or six hundred cattle one person uh by you know by the skilled grazing techniques uh and they will put the the, the fat on the cattle so they're ready for market and those cattle will be uniformly um ready uh the, they'll be uh ready for slaughter and processing and the meat will be a wonderful eating experience that will be tasty and, and uh, consistently high quality, which is what the wholesale markets, stores and restaurants require. So what we and this was really Ridge's vision that that of uh, this idea of separating the production into these two phases 
And uh, again, this can be a, adapted to a, all parts of the country. In New England, it definitely means a, a lot of, of small cow-calf operations feeding into um, you know, a smaller number of finishing operations um, to get both the, the volume that, that wholesale markets require and also the consistent quality. So I just wanted to mention that because the economic part, the, the, the potential for this to revive rural economies all over the country um, should, uh, should be heartening to people who, who care about saving family farming and, and saving our farmland and um, you know, getting on the more half healthful path in terms of uh, the environment and nutrient dense food. This is, this is good news for all those folks. Yeah, but now we're talking to Rid Shin and Lynn Pledger, uh, co-authors of this amazing book. It is called Grass-Fed Beef for a Post-Pandemic World. What a great title. I just, love, I just love that title. I think I knew that that was your title, but that somehow I forgot it. And then when I saw it again, I was like, oh, wow. <clears throat> That's great. And then, and then the subtitle is uh, equally amazing here. Um, um, how regenerative grazing can restore soils and stabilize the climate. Uh, you know, I just love it. Like if all you get out of this book is the title and the subtitle, you're already like, <laughs> you're, you're already leaps ahead of where the, of where the typical person is. Um, and uh, was there another plug I wanted to make? Uh, uh, um, may maybe not. Yeah, so, so Soil for Climate Giving Tuesday fundraiser today for drought relief in East Africa. Please follow the link to that. And right now we're talking to Rid Shin and Lynn Pledger, um, authors of, of this great book. Um, you know, uh, uh, Ridge, you said something earlier that really caught my attention. Um, and that was that with the industrial model, the more you scale it, the worse it gets on the environment and the cows and the people. And that with the regenerative model, the more you scale it, the better it gets. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's like, oh, my oh. God. Right. Of course. You know, and, you know, it just gets better. There's more land being healed, more people not being right. sick. Um, and. <laughs> And you know more carbon being mitigated, more resilience to drought and flood. It's like scaling is a good thing. It's what you want to. It's what you want to scale, and you know that whole concept itself is just so counterintuitive. And the notion that scaling something makes it even that much better for everyone, like it's not. It's not a trade off where like well the economics are better, but the but the environment is worse off. It's like, no, everything keeps getting better. The environment keeps getting better and the economics keeps getting better. And Lynn made a point, another sort of misunderstanding people have, which is that they still think of it as less bad. And, and when you see the discussions in the, the climate sphere now, you know, on LinkedIn and Twitter, all the conversations are around, are around less bad, around mitigating harm where we can reduce harm by 20 percent um cell meat or vegan meat is less bad than in than real meat industrial industrial will you raise and they always pick the the worst possible example to compare to you know so the sure. worst possible example of industrial meat that this CAFO finished relies on the GMO corn and soy. Um, uh, yes, um, a, 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 a soy burger that's still relying on the same GMO corn and soy um, is less bad because it doesn't have the CAFO involved, but it's still horrifying. It's right. horrifying. <laughs> you know, it's hard. Well, <laughs> yeah. yeah. The thing yeah, that's the thing ahead. that's amazing is that um it works for everybody in the system. So cattle love to be in a good a big group, you know, reminiscent of the buffalo. They love to be in a big herd. They don't like to be in a big herd on a CAFO that does never move and stands in their own feces. 
They don't like that at all. It makes them sick. But they love being in a big herd and moving in a natural way, you know, across the landscape like the buffalo. I mean, there's there's our biomimicry is the buffalo. We always go back to that. But the but the fact is the cattle are happy, the operators happy. They, you know, they don't have to spray any poison. There's no uh, pharmaceuticals that have to be applied to the system. There's no antibiotics that need to be, you know, this again and again and again, there's all these things to get eliminated from the system when you do it in this regenerative way. And, um, and then you go on to the consumer and the meat is actually, does not have high levels of omega-3. It's got a perfect balance of omega-3, omega-6. And what we're discovering now is that there are all these plants in the world, all these phytonutrients that never get into the human diet unless they're consumed by a ruminant. And then they're consumed in the meat and the milk. I mean, this is remarkable work. I mean, David Montgomery and Ann Bickley just wrote a book. You know, everybody says, you are what you eat. Everybody's heard that. And their thesis is, you are what your food eats, which is, takes it just to the next level. And, and the cattle, are eating something that we can't possibly obtain as human, but it can come into our diet and it's very, very healthy compared to what's coming into our diet from the CAFO. So, you know, everybody wins, the cattle, the, the operator, the human that eats it, you know, it, and then that's before you even begin to talk about society and the winds there of water, the water system functionally functioning, you know, carbon is get, coming out of the air and into the ground at a stable situation, you know, all those things that we're looking for these really crazy high-tech solutions for. And we find that, you know, in a fairly short period of time, if you get these cattle going, the cattle are the keystone species that makes the system work gets those the soil food web working below the soil, which is what makes the carbon transfers work. And, you know, it, it's just a remarkable system. If people could embrace it. That, that great summary that Ridge just made, I think is, is uh, um, what, what, what can be held by Seth's point of, about less bad, that we're not talking less bad here. We're talking about a tremendous good that we, that we can uh, you know realize a tremendous benefit even if you didn't eat the meat just putting the meat aside even if you're a vegetarian you can support regenerative grazing and we hope you will because of it's such a boon to to the planet and uh uh because of and, and it's it's not only it's a climate it's a climate benefit with the carbon sequestration uh, that has all these additional benefits of, of you know, the food and, uh, and, and human health. So uh, I, I think that that, that is, is a one way, uh, you know, to, to make these points that Ridge has just made to introduce it by saying, if you don't wanna eat meat, fine, we're, you know, that, that's your choice. But here is why you, you, you should support regenerative grazing. And, and um, uh, let me also just put out there, if people have questions, please just ask them in the, in the Facebook um, you know, feed here. Um, um, I have a question about the business side. Uh, did you guys see the Will Harris interview on Joe Rogan? I, I I saw that it happened. I haven't really gone blow by blow for through it. Uh, Owen, did you get a chance to see? No, that? I haven't read it either. Uh, no, it's not a read. It's it's the Joe Rogan podcast. The podcast. Yeah. Well, um, I mean, it's great that it happened. You know, it's already had around two million views. He mentions Alan Savory and holistic management. Um, so that there's that's great. Um, but on the business side, he was talking about you know, the realities of what it's like trying to be a sort of a mid-level producer. And, you know, it's very difficult. He says a typical order would be, in the industry would be like 40,000 pounds or whatever. 
of you know six ounce ribeye. Like, like like that's the type of order that will go out to the field. Like we need it for this Chicago suburb. You know, we need forty thousand pounds of six ounce ribeye. Um, how do you, and that's the type of thing Tyson will say, okay, you know, we've got it. Right. Um, well, the, the, the challenge, Seth, I, do you have more questions? <laughs> no, you get, you get the gist of it. How does... Yeah, I, I'll respond to that because, yeah. you know, our chapter on processing goes into a whole lot of that history of processing. And, you know, there's many of us that are in this field that have embraced small is beautiful. You know, I mean, small is better than big. And what we have found, my, my own personal experience in, in using many, many different plants and processors is that small is not necessarily beautiful because some of the things that are missing in the small operation are the skill set. Uh, the inability to use the awful, you know, one plant we use makes us pay to throw away the, the oxtails and the kidneys and the livers rather than using them because there's not enough volume to go to market. So I think um, Will's point is very salient. And, you know, one of the, the way we're thinking about it now is that if we build the supply so we can harvest um, <clears throat> at scale, you know, three or four truckloads, 250, 300 animals per week, take them into a bigger plant. It's not necessarily anything wrong with a bigger plant. They actually have some economies of scale, which are remarkable, and they do a mid-level plant. Some of the large plants, maybe it's not the case, but, you know, what I have found in some of the mid-level plants in our region, and there's only a couple, is that the, the care of the animals is exquisite. The care of the the up the um, people that work in the plants is excellent, and the cost parameters are about thirty percent of what the small local, you know, God love them plants cost. And the the um, so if we want to go to market at scale, the the key is to create the scale on the farm, and that's where this concept of ours that that you know nationally. In our region, the Northeast, which includes West Virginia, Maryland, Delaware, Pennsylvania, the New England, New York, there's about 500,000 calves that are born every year that all go west to the feedlot. And that's just how it works. You know, they're born on farms that are 20 to 30 head. That's the national average of cow-calf operation. So that bifurcation of the industry exists. But what happens now is the cattle go west. And we're saying, no, keep the cattle here. Keep the manure, keep the jobs, keep the, the, the nutrients, keep all those things here in the Northeast, but go to a finishing farm where you have six to 800 head. And now you can finish them efficiently. You can never finish cattle efficiently at a 20 to 30 head size. You can finish them, It'll take you a long time, and it won't be efficient. So that's the concept. And then as you come out of those finishing farms, you have enough scale to go to these mid-level plants where you can get the skills, skill set. You can get, you know, like, like one of the plants we use for me to get an E. coli test, to test my meat for E. coli, it costs $75 and takes 48 hours. They take a test, send it to Pennsylvania. We have to wait 48 hours to process our meat. You go to the mid-level plant, and the meat just goes down, the, the, uh, there's a probe put in, it puts on a, on a bench, pass or no pass. And you know, it just, you can go right straight to processing. Some of those efficiencies you can never gain in the little tiny plant, God love them. So, so it is an issue, if you're gonna get to a lot of people, you, you, do, you do, do need to get you know, up to a scale. I mean, we spent a lot of time going over that in the book, trying to explain that to people. Um, uh, Ridge, you just used a term that I love, finishing farm. Correct. So um, when most people hear finishing, they think CAFO. Precisely. Right. So, yeah. Big so, distinction. Yeah. <laughs> so make, make that distinction, if you will. Talk okay. about it. Okay. Well, a finish, uh, so in order for cattle to be finished, 
In other words, to go from being a yearling, uh, 12 months, 13 months, whatever, to become a fat, finished animal, they need a lot of energy. <clears throat> so how the CAFO does it is they park them on the CAFO and they pour the energy in and form of corn and soy, mainly corn. Now that makes the cattle sick and they have to add baking soda that, to try and buffer the rumen so they don't have acidosis. You know, there's all kinds of health problems have resulted. On the finishing farm, what we're doing is we have a farm with enough acres, like we have one in Vermont with 1800 acres. And the key is that in the plant itself, everybody sees a plant, they think everything's the same in this plant. But actually the energy in the plant resides in the top of the plant. So the key is to move the cattle like a herd of buffalo, let them eat the tops of the plants, trample the rest and move. So they constantly have enough energy to fill their rumen and put on fat. So that's the key with the finishing farm. And it is, it's a management technique. It's, it's having a farm with some scale. And, you know, the economics work, if you have uh, 650 head, you two or three people can move 650 head. And the economics are dramatically better than one and a half people trying to move 20 head. So Rich, let's just add here that, that when you're talking about moving the cattle to the next, you know, uh, paddock that has so they can eat the tops of the plants, we're talking about moving these cattle on the finishing farm, maybe three times a day. Whereas on the cow calf right. operation, you'd be moving them every three days. That's that's what I was referring to when I said you can run right. a cow calf operation and still keep your day job, but finishing yeah. is a full time the, job. The animals have very different nutritional needs. So on the cow calf farm, <clears throat> the mother is fully grown, so she needs maintenance ration, and she produces milk which feeds the cow. So in reality, as Lynn says, you know. If, as long as you change paddocks every three days, I mean, a plant grows, it gets eaten, and it takes three days to grow again. So you don't want to nip it off again. So, so you should move the cattle every three days. But on the finishing farm, your goal is to let them eat just the tops of the plant all the time. So it's a, it's a, it's a, a very different motion than the cow-calf farm. But that's what we talk about when we say a finishing farm. And some people, as we've indicated, um, you know, uh, have uh, custom finish other people's cattle. Uh, well, they, they may finish ours. They'd be big picture beef. Say they finish for big picture beef, or they may finish for other small people, uh, small operations in their own area. It, it's, it's, a, it's a whole new thing, finishing cattle on pasture, a whole new uh, skill. And, and the finishing farm itself would, in an ideal situation, be a, um, uh, uh, an example of ecological restoration. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. No, actually, you know, it, it, it's great. I just, pardon me if I've interrupted you, Ridge, but I love in the, in the very first, uh, let's see, is it the introduction, I think. Um, I've got a sidebar from Ridge's uh, a trip he, he was made to Saskatchewan. And, um, to, and uh, the story is about coyotes, but, but at the end of that description um, is reference to the fact that th this farm, this is the Wobisher farm and, and the little story is about Brady Wobisher, but his parents were given the, the biggest environmental honor in Canada. Uh, by their farm was was given this award as being a a vibrant ecological landscape. This is a cattle farm, right? Giving being given this high environmental honor as being a, a, a vibrant, you know, natural community, um, uh, fostering you know diversity uh, in terms of of plants and animals, et cetera, et cetera. So I, I just think that that's a wonderful example of what you just said, uh, uh, that a finishing farm is, is, is a, 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 a piece of land that's, that's been restored, regenerated by these farming practices. Yeah, and you know, Dennis Wobisher was a very early proponent of holistic management. He was one of Helen's first people. He was on the board. And he's deceased now, but yeah, 
this 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 stuff really works and and it works at scale so it is it's an interesting new option now um one of the points that um will also made in his podcast with joe rogan is he said that unfortunately um whole foods was you know greenwashing to a certain extent and um wasn't making the proper distinction between the different types and they just have these like four or five categories uh, what do they call it tier one or whatever and i've seen it myself yeah, they, have, they have the gap categories and you know it's so much of this certification is a diversion you know so whole foods created the gap certification the animal has to be you know raised like this like that you know the, the animal can't be castrated at over 30 days or that's inhumane you know well i've castrated cattle at a year old and 30 months and i would be hard pressed to determine which one hurt differently you know what i mean but it's been codified by whole foods and you have to and, and the certifying body charges the farmer a whole lot of money so that so whole foods has set up the certification program the gap one two three four or one two three five and if you want to sell meat to them you have to participate it costs two thousand dollars a farm it's very expensive and um at the end of the day all it talks is about humane treatment. It doesn't talk about some of the other important regenerative points at all. They're just not, you know, included in that certification that they've created. There's other certifications that are just about humane. There's others just about GMOs. There's others. So, so there's all these certification entities that have tried to get between the farmer and the marketplace and explain, oh, this is better. But it, it's it's a um, it's a wild west out there, and you know to to Will's point, some of the big corporations because they are a big market um, can kind of do what they want. I mean, most recently Whole Foods decided to stop buying lobster for some reason, so basically put the whole main lobster lobster industry out of business because I'm not sure what the particulars are, but they're very very powerful. The marketplace is very powerful and the challenge is getting the customer to really understand what's going on and it's hard because it's complicated even me as a fairly well-educated customer going to whole food and get flummoxed by some of the signs and some of the things that they do and they're done very intentionally in a corporate way so it's 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 infuriating but <laughs> there it is well, well what are your thoughts about how to get better labeling um well and you know at the end of the day i think eventually a uh and this is our proposal is to put an actual ear tag on the animal and have a traceability right to the dna to post-harvest so and this technology exists in europe you have to know where every animal is every day of its life that's the law so when the animal moves to slaughter, there's a passport that said, well, this animal was part of a herd that moved across the street on September 23rd, blah, blah, blah. So all that data is there. And, and what we know now is you can actually harvest that animal and you can actually take a fairly inexpensive DNA sample and correlate that to the ear tag. So you have the whole life cycle of the animal with clarity to the consumer. Now. Part of the reason the U.S. does not do this, like even to the extent of a country of origin labeling, to even say, oh, it was born and raised in the U.S. is because of the, um, you know, the, the, the big, big lobbies that are the processing and the beef industry and on and on. But at the end of the day, if the consumer could know precisely where that animal came from, then they could do the research. They could go find which farm it lived on when it was a cow calf, which finishing farm it went to, what slaughterhouse it was harvested in. And at the end of the day, I think that's what the consumer wants to know. And it could be done very inexpensively without a third party certifier 
jumping in between and <clears throat> charging the farmer a lot of costs. And Seth, I think this is just bring what Rich said brings up an important point that we make in the book and what we'd like to make here. And that is what, what our vision is that every region of the country is raising its own grass fed beef. This can be done even in you know, the dry Southwest and has been and is being done. Uh, the, you know, the, you're, not, you're not moving the, the animals, uh, uh, you know, you're not re returning to a paddock you graze that year. It'll take a whole year maybe because of the lack of rainfall to regenerate a, a, a paddock that could be regenerated quickly in the Northeast. But, but it's the same basic system with some adaptations. And so this would mean that every region of our country would be resilient in terms of you know, supplying protein food to its residents. And that would, that would make, um, you know, right now when the food system has a big shock, such as the pandemic, right? And you have, you, you know, when, when, when uh, you know, a handful of big packing houses close down, say, because of COVID or whatever it is, it could be pandemic, it could be terrorism, it could be, you know, wars, it could be ransomware attacks. All these things are part of our, the reality now. We have to expect them. And we can re be resilient in, in, in the face of these threats if every region has its own you know, uh, beef supply system, supply of healthy, healthy meat. And um, so when Ridge talks about, you know, knowing the farm where it came from, well, that's not, uh, uh, you know, it, th that could be very meaningful if, if you were living in the Southwest, for example, or any, anywhere you lived where, where you would have a much better understanding of, of where <coughs> your meat came from um, and, and a much better chance of, of, of you know, doing that research and even, even going there if you wanna, if you wanna see the place. Um, and uh, so I think that's, that's really key. That's a really key part of our book is that um, what, what we're advocating for is, you know, may, maybe not um, a, a kind of a, a, a happy medium between these na national between our, you know, meat going thousands of miles, and 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 everybody relying on the farmer next door. There's a there's a big middle ground there that could be met by regional supplies according to the model that that uh, that we lay out in the book of of cow calf farms, and um, and finishing farms. Um, uh, Ridge. And when do you have anything to say about policy um, specifically? So you were just talking uh, sort of generally in terms of like a vision of how America in general can have better resilience against um, uh, some sort of food flow um, interruption, whether it's the result of a pandemic or, you know, something you know, human malicious, some supply chain terrorist attack or, or whatever, um, you are talking, you know, nonetheless about greater regional resilience. But, but getting to the issue now of policy, is there specific policy either at yeah. the regional or the national level, like the Farm Bill, for example, that you want to comment on? Well, you know, the biggest thing is... Um, and, you know, a lot of these things are not possible because of the way policy is derived. But the biggest one is the subsidy for corn. You know, that is a huge factor that <clears throat> really, uh, when you look at the map of the states and what they grow, there's, there's, a, there's a number of states in the Midwest that grow that 97% of that crop is corn and soy. And the main... And nobody makes a tremendous amount of money at this. What they are farming is the farm bill. So what makes them whole is that little subsidy they get from the U.S. government, and they have to then use the poisons when, when they when they grow grain at the scale that we do these days with this huge monoculture on vast acreages. You know, you, you're kind of locked into the GMOs, the Roundup, 
the sprays, all the, the biocides, all that kind of stuff. And it's perpetuated by the government. <clears throat> and and you lay on top, you layer on top of that the whole ethanol thing, which again is a is a real insanity. You know, the ethanol takes more uh, energy to produce than is produced, but you you get some of those Midwest states that have, have begin getting that bonus. I mean, I talked to my friend Brady, Brady in um, Canada, and he said, "Why are you guys doing this ethanol? You know, we investigated it, we did our due diligence, and it doesn't work." And I said, "But well, Brady, if the U.S. government comes to you and says, look, build an ethanol plant, we'll give you five million dollars, and we will force the consumer to buy this product at the pump." You say, thank you, sir, take their money. And that's the reality that we're dealing with. So between the ethanol and the corn subsidy, those are the big ones. Whether we can get rid of them, that would make a massive difference to, you know, a lot of people say to me, how come your beef is more expensive than in the store than the, than the commodity beef? And I said, it's because of the damn subsidy. <laughs> you know, it's not more expensive. You just paid your taxes. They paid the USDA. The USDA paid the farmers, subsidized that other meat. That's why you're looking at a difference in price. So, so without that, without that, we're just saying then grass grass fed beef would be the low. That would be the low cost of production if we didn't have the subsidies. Absolutely. But then the other ones are, you know, the country of origin labeling. That's a real clear. Um, and already some of the money is beginning to flow in the direction, there's a lot of um, appetite for shifting money toward climate smart solutions. I don't think a lot of people understand what that is. I think a lot of that money will get frittered away, but it's great to see the impulse on the, way, on the part of the government that this is something important. But those are the big, um, policy things that I see is that you know. yeah I think we want we want to uh, emphasize that the Biden administration does have some good information about this um, you know it, it it some of their their the money uh, the Biden administration has uh, allocated money for um, for regenerative agriculture they that's that's becoming a, a you know that they perk up uh, and uh, people in Congress are perking up when they hear regenerative. Now they have an inkling of what this means. There's also uh, they they've, they're also quite aware that they need to start enforcing fair trade practices, some of which are on the books and some of which need to be strengthened um, because of the situation where you've got the four companies, uh, I, I you know Cargill and JBS and um, so forth. Uh, there's four of them controlling the the meat industry. So. So, you know, the, 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 the um, farmers and ranchers are up in arms about that because they're not getting, like if, during the pandemic, for example, those big companies that, that control the whole supply, vertically integrated companies, you know, they made out like bandits um, because the meat of price was so high and they got those profits, not the, not the farmers and ranchers who supplied that meat. So um, the, the Biden administration has made some commitments uh, along those lines, and we mentioned that in the book, uh, uh, and it's footnoted. Um, but I, I think you know, you mentioned the farm bill. You know, people can get involved in that, and uh, you know, in the last few pages of the book, that's what we talk about: is is uh, making your feelings known to your elected representatives in terms of this farm bill and what you want to see in terms of support for regenerative agriculture. And, and, and I wonder um, how we can get the support for regenerative agriculture without necessarily um, needing to defeat the, the ethanol thing, because that is so mammoth, yeah. you know, well, and the, the reality is that if you're just trying to defeat that, you're just going to be crushed, or at least in the short term, and no one's going to pay attention to you. It, right. it, 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 so is there is there an advocacy we could have that could realistically move forward without there, necessarily yeah, have to, it, to fight the, the ethanol? Absolutely. Thing? You know, I mean, the big, big thing, Seth, is that if the customer will embrace <clears throat> buying grass fed and trying to discern whether it's domestic grass fed, the reality is that when you embrace these regenerative principles, you increase the biomass per acre 
a minimum of a threefold. Richard Teague says it's actually probably sixfold. So now all of a sudden, this is an unfair advantage. If I have, uh, you know, six times the biomass on my piece of land, you know, if I'm, am I renting it for $25 an acre, all of a sudden my rent is what? <laughs> $3, $3.50 an acre. That's the real advantage is that economically, when this is done right, it is really um, uh, very, um, you know, very efficient. And, and oh, I was just going to say, I, I, the, the, of course, that's absolutely true. But but I think what Seth may be getting at is, how, you know, uh, how do we organize in terms of advocacy and, um, you know, for legislation and so forth. And uh, uh, I'll just throw out one idea uh, uh, in the book. I, you know, I mentioned people can even three people can be an advocacy group, but you do have have groups organized. The first one that comes to mind is Kiss the Ground, which is uh, which is has a program. They are focused on the farm bill, and um, their re re regenerate, re regeneration of soil is their is their mission. And um, you know what they say sh is the mission of our whole generation is to regenerate the soil. So. You know, that's the first thing that comes to my mind. You know, go to their website, kiss the ground, and and uh, you know, join join that that. Uh, 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 I mean, all the. Uh, I think there's many groups out there that are working on that issue, but I think for people that want, you know, that are looking for a, a public policy advocacy, um, that joining on with groups like that. Uh, lending support to groups like that uh, is is an, a, a good way to go. A in addition to voting with your do food dollar, as Ridge is pointing out, that's also tremendously <clears throat> important. Also, <laughs> I can just I can't can't resist uh, saying this. Um, Any time you hear this, someone proudly um, uh, expressing allegiance to plant based solutions question that because industrial uh, vegetable production is in no way an appropriate uh, uh, alternative to industrial meat production. It's still, you know, every time you see that, you know, those plowed croplands, those monocultures of crops, you're seeing carbon dioxide rising. I mean, you can't see it, but that's what's happening. Picture that. Picture the carbon dioxide rising from those, those fields of, for example, peas and beans, not just corn, but uh, the, all those things that are in the, the fake meat burgers. It's all industrial, industrially. For, for one thing, none of it is whole food. None of it is whole vegetables, but it, the foundation of it depends on the, the industrial cultivation of, of monoculture uh, vegetables, which is not a good thing. So. Plant-based as a phrase really means nothing in terms of environmental good or in terms of health. But, you know, people have, uh, it's a lot for people to absorb. There's a lot of, there's a lot of science, soil science in the last 20 or 30 years that, you know, we certainly haven't absorbed as a culture. And it, but when you think about it, you know, soil science has made such astonishing um, uh, progress recently, um, you know, um, Elena Ingram is, is tells the story about how, I, I don't know how old she is, but, but when she was uh, doing her, was it her, probably her PhD, so this could have been, you know, in the 60s, I, I don't know, but uh, she, she was saying, uh, the, the last, cent, mid, middle of, of the last century, say, she went to her advisor and said, you know, I, I'm really interested in these, uh, you know, uh, beings that live in the soil, these, these uh, microbes and, and uh, all, these, all these things are in the soil. What is their function? And her advisor says, oh, they're just there. <laughs> they're just there. No, no function. And she, you know, but, but she persisted. And, she, and of course that's been her life's work and her fabulous contribution um, uh, and, and of course, this whole field of soil science and, and microbiologists know that our very existence depends on these beings in the soil. 
So, and you have as recently as, I think it was 1996, Sarah Wright um, and her research assistant, Christine Nichols, who is still very active in the field, discovered, identified glomalin, this substance created by the, by the, the, the fungi in the soil that, that, that holds the water, that stores the carbon, uh, you know, just critically important understanding of this glomalin, this substance, how many people, it's hardly a household word, but it should be. So the point I'm making is this, this stuff was discovered in the 1990s. Has it, re has it transformed agriculture? No, we're still using the, the we're still using the, the weapons of war, the chemicals, uh, you know, created to fight World War II, and we're still putting them in the ground because that's what, you know, that was the game after World War II is to, you know, um, to apply the biocides and so forth. And science has come such a long way, but it hasn't reached, it hasn't reached, uh, the, you know, farm policy. We're still doing these crazy, uh, uh, crazy things. We're, we're talking about, say, you know, put, putting nitrogen on, on, the, on the fields. And at the same time, we know that nitrogen is polluting not just our waterways, it's on the land now, it's, it's a serious, it's right up there with climate change and, and, and biodiversity uh, and you know, deforestation, nitrogen pollution, a lot in large part from this nitrogen that's being put on the ground. But we, we don't have to be doing that. And, and right. had, had these scientific discoveries backing a different way, and the different way is regenerative agriculture. So people have to have to learn this that we've we have updated information, folks, science-based information that can address these confounding global problems uh, uh, that are keeping us all awake at night. So uh, let's pause. Let's pause in our um, uh, our search for ever ever uh, more expensive and risky technological solutions and tries to try a solution that's been around uh, since prior to the human beings on earth. Right. Well, that's that what natural if you, systems. If you get up a little ways and you look at it and you think, oh my God, we're putting nitrogen on a boat in Russia or the Ukraine. We're shipping it across the ocean. We're putting it in a truck. We're taking it to our Midwest, pouring it on the ground, which kills the ground. The excess goes down the Mississippi and kills the uh, Gulf of Mexico and more. And then we take and put that stuff that we grow on another truck that takes and makes the cattle sick, makes the humans sick. It's this system that's just, it's just insanity. And yet the only question that comes up when the, with the war in Ukraine is how we're we gonna get more fertilizer. That's not the question. You know, how are we gonna just stop and go to a system where we don't need it? I mean, it's, it's we, crazy. We feel rather strongly about these points. <laughs> <laughs> and well, I know you do too. Uh, you at, at Soil for Climate, are, we're all on the same team here trying to turn this situation around. Well, God, God love you. Um, let me uh, bring people up, up to speed again. This is Seth Iskan with Soil for Climate. Um, and we are talking now with Ridge Shin and Lynn Pledger, authors of this amazing book. And I will um, turn off my virtual background again. So, um, so, so I can hold it up to the camera and you can see it better. And there it is, uh, grass-fed beef for a post-pandemic world, how regenerative grazing can restore soil and stabilize the climate with a forward by Gay Brown. And I, I just love the title. The title just, just makes me warm and happy inside. And, uh, and let's also hear it for Chelsea Green Publishing in Vermont. They're, they, they really bring the truth. Um, well, the other thing to say, uh, Seth, is the book is in print and you can buy it from anywhere where you buy your books. It's available on Barnes and Noble, Amazon, Chelsea Green directly, and so or your local bookstore can order it for you if they don't carry it, but ask them to carry it. Yeah, right. absolutely. So, um, just kind of curious about that. What sort of 
the interviews are you getting or book tours or reviews or, or what's sort of happening in that space? We're really, we're really uh, happy to have more. We've, um, we, we just uh, did an interview recently uh, by the um, uh, Organic Consumer Association uh and uh and that was great that was uh, right at the top of their newsletter uh we just did a small a talk on a small uh, radio show out of boulder called how on earth uh looking into this uh the mechanics of how all this wonderful stuff is happening uh in the soil and um uh you know i'm beginning to do some uh, bookstore gigs and that kind of thing but we we're happy to you know to get on a zoom we're, we're like what we did today yeah, we're looking for more venues. I did go to the Regenerate Conference in uh, Denver recently, which is hosted by uh, HMI, American Grass Fed, and Quivera Co uh, Coalition, and you know, signed the books there. And so, but we're we're absolutely looking for ways to promote the book and and make get it people access to it. So, any ideas are welcome. Okay, what about uh, the Washington Post and the New York Times and uh, and the Boston Globe and the Boston Herald and that would be great. You can hook us up, Seth. You can hook us up. Let's right? Yeah, yeah. Any, any. We'd be happy to receive the services of any publicists out there who want to uh, um, to earn their reward in heaven can, <laughs> can help us out by by promoting our book. The, the the permanent pasture well um <laughs> we uh we we do um uh we sort of have a, a publicist that, that we work with um and uh we have been building a database on um journalists who write about this topic and write about land use and climate and meat and you know these this is sort of a key topic um yeah. Well, we're very open to interviews yeah. of any kind, and because because obviously we spend quite a bit of time writing this book, and we think it's a very important thing. So well, I, I, it's a, you mentioned the New York Times, and that's a particular frustration to me because um, they they occasionally you know will will write something about regenerative agriculture or grass fed beef, but they are really they have not come out in their climate. Their climate work is very focused on emissions reduction to the exclusion of carbon sequestration. And the reasons the, the reasons given, I, I'll tell you what, what typically happens in, in these discussions is that when, when you look at certain studies that compare, you know, because studies of the benefits of grass-fed beef are compared to conventional beef, um, and, and you see that the studies were done without factoring in the benefit of carbon sequestration. Well, if you're not going to look at that, um, you're, you know, you're not going to have a, a true picture at all. Or they're looking, they're comparing it to um, uh, corn fed beef without looking at the, the uh, climate implications of raising corn. Again, that's a big problem. So some of the poorly designed studies uh, are not um, showing grass-fed beef in a true light, and and the New York Times just—I mean, I've written so many letters, uh, you know, and 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 I, I don't know, I don't know what the mindset is, but what where the block is, but it's not, you know, we really need to get to these um, uh, outlets that we are reaching a lot of people because, you know, this is good news. This is good news for for anybody who takes the time to listen, and people would be interested. And it's all science based now. I mean, for you know, what really drives me crazy uh, is that you know when the, they go back twenty years and and look at what somebody said about grass carbon sequestration. Uh, you know, we don't have to go back that far. We have studies done this year, last year, the year before, brand new peer-reviewed science, the science has been done, it's there, the methodology is at hand, it's political will that we need, and we're not going to get that unless we get an overwhelming public support and demand. And it's been growing, but very, but but slowly. And, uh, you know, um, it, what we need is is people that, that you know, will, will help us get this word out to, to um, 
you know, particularly to the the community of of climate activists who 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 would be thrilled if they understood. I mean, and some of them are clearly some of them are, um, but it's it's just growing very slowly because this idea that beef is bad is so ingrained that they don't realize we're talking about natural systems that um, you know that. Uh, uh, as Rich says, like photosynthesis, like nutrient cycle, nutrient cycling. These are the natural systems we're working with and fostering, uh, and, and in a very low tech way. Uh, so I think it's a, it's all, it's all good news. It's good news for health. It's good news for the climate. It's good news for rural economies and family farms. Um, people need to take a look and listen.